audience from uh, what I'm used to speaking to. I'm used to usually speaking to loggers and, and landowners and consulting foresters, but I think this is a great opportunity to uh, talk about the AMP's a different group of folks, and because of that, I'm going to be assuming that even though some of you may have heard of the AMPs, you may not all be all that familiar with them, so I'm basically going to be starting from, from scratch and working my way through. Uh, before I get into the meat of the AMPs, I'll talk a little bit about the role that forests provide for water quality. I'll then address about how logging can affect water quality if not done correctly, and how the AMPs can protect water quality when correctly implemented. From there, I'll provide you with some background on the AMPs and share with you results of the AMP monitoring program, uh, working with loggers and landowners. Then I'll provide an update on the revisions being made to the AMPs and talk about how the revision relates to Act 64, uh, the Vermont Clean Water Act of 2015, and the Lake Champlain TMDL. Forests provide a variety of critical ecosystem services that protect watershed function and water quality. They're not only sponges for water, allowing recharge of groundwater and slow, slow release of heavy precipitation to the stream, there are also many treatment plants for a myriad of pollutants from water and the air. Forests retain nearly all the nitrogen deposited on them from the atmosphere and can filter and process 50 to 90 percent of nitrate and groundwaters that flow through them or on their way to streams and rivers. Our forests play a vital role in providing for clean water. An intact forest floor which contains wood, leaf litter, humus, and fibrous roots in addition to mineral soil is the most important element of the forest that helps to filter sediment and other pollutants from surface runoff. Because forest soils are often highly porous and permeable, Rainwater can infiltrate into the soil freely. The litter and humus protect the mineral soil from raindrops by absorbing the impact energy of rain droplets. It's estimated that up to 80% of the total stream miles in a watershed are made up of small headwater streams. These are the types of streams that we deal with mostly during forestry operations. They are common and widespread across Vermont's landscape. They're characterized by their steep gradients and cold temperatures. They're also highly oxygenated, oxygenated, making them suitable for brook trout, an indicator species for healthy streams. Today's logging practices bear a little resemblance to historical logging practices and their environmental consequences. States have adopted BMPs to protect the water quality, prevent soil erosion, and maintain stream temperatures. These pictures here that you see on this slide, um, the upper right-hand corner uh, is a log drive that occurred on, uh, I think this is in the town of Sharon. Um, log drives are very common uh, back in the 1800s and into the early 1900s. Wow. Um, it shows us how, and you can also, it's also interesting to Note the uh, denuded hillsides here in that, in that picture. Very different type of landscape than what we have uh, today as a result of uh, heavy height rating uh, logging practices. Um, so our, our, our rivers were abused in many different ways. Um, down in the lower left-hand corner, um, that illustrates um, best management practices of how we protect water quality and logging operations today uh, using portable skitter bridges. Forests play a vital role in providing for clean water. However, timber harvesting can directly and negatively impact water quality by affecting how water flows through the forest. In particular, constructing roads, trails, and landings can reduce soil perme permeability. 
This can occur anytime the forest floor is disturbed, removed, compacted, or otherwise damaged. Increased soil erosion. The opportunity for soil to be carried away by surface runoff greatly increases when mineral soil is, is exposed or fill is used. Diverting water flow. Roads and trails can block or intercept water moving over or through the soil. When water volume and velocity increases, there's also a greater chance that it will form a channel and start eroding soil. Sometimes harvesting can cause streams to erode a new channel by blocking the stream's flow with logs or debris. Concentrated water flow. Roads, trails, and log landings can collect and funnel surface runoff, creating rills and gullies. In these situations, water erodes and transports exposed soil in its path. These are the potential impacts of timber harvesting, and they include increased turbidity, sedimentation, excessive logging slash, increased stream temperatures, and chemical pollutants. Sediment is the most common pollutant associated with timber harvesting. Timber harvesting equipment, which drags or carries trees over the ground, will loosen an exposed soil. Bare ground that is exposed during harvesting operations can be eroded by rainwater and enter nearby streams. Anytime soil is exposed, there is potential for erosion and sedimentation to occur in nearby streams and other bodies of water. DMPs are preventative measures that help control erosion and protect the water quality. Proper implementation of the, of the EMPs will help absorb and disperse runoff, retain soil nutrients, filter sediment, and prevent fluctuations in water temperature. The EMPs minim minimize the risk of sediment and other pollutants getting into streams and other bodies of water. As I've already mentioned, sediment is the primary water pollutant associated with logging. AMPs divert surface water into undisturbed vegetated areas of the forest before it gains sufficient speed and volume to cause soil erosion. Once diverted, the natural control mechanisms of an undisturbed forest floor work to stop rapid surface runoff water flow, absorb it, and trap the sediment. Techniques such as water bars, broad-based steps are examples of AMPs that control surface water flow. AMPs also maintain the natural flow of water and streams. The AMPs are designed to keep streams flowing within natural stream channels and prevent damage to the stream bed and banks. Prohibiting logging slash in streams, choosing adequately sized stream crossing structures for expected peak flows, and appropriate selection of stream crossing structures based upon stream conditions are all examples of AMPs that are designed to accommodate natural water flow of streams. <clears throat> the AMPs also protect stream bank vegetation. Minimal disturbance to the forest floor within stream buffers maintains the high filtering and infiltrative capacity common to forest soils. Maintaining tree cover along streams minimizes stream temperature fluctuations. Root systems of trees along stream banks increase resistance to erosion. AMPs restrict logging equipment from operating within 25 feet of any stream or body of water and provide for minimum buffer widths where partial cutting can occur so that openings in the canopy are minimal and continuous cover is maintained. The AMPs are measures to protect the water quality that are based upon principles of water resource protection. Those principles include planning the operation, controlling water flow, stabilizing disturbed soil, managing chemical pollutants, and minimizing the biological impacts to stream corridors. I'll talk a little bit now about these principles and how they correlate to practices on the ground.
Prior to commencing a logging operation, it's important to develop a plan to protect water quality as well as soil productivity. Planning to protect water quality is the best management practice. It's important to develop first-hand knowledge and familiarity with the area to be logged. An on-the-ground evaluation should be done before logging begins. Here are some general planning recommendations for protecting water quality before starting a logging operation. Identify streams, wetlands, and other surface waters. Maps and aerial photos can help identify surface water features, steep slopes, or poorly drained soils. Because no map is 100% accurate, they should be used as a reference to identify potentially sensitive areas that must be verified on the ground before logging begins. Additionally, there may be features within the area to be logged that are not evident on any maps, so a thorough walkthrough is a good idea. Trees and vegetation adjacent to surface water features play an important role in maintaining water quality and controlling fluctuations in stream temperature. These areas should be managed with special considerations. This includes determining how many truck roads, stream crossings, log landings, and skid trails will be needed and where they should be located. They should be kept to a minimum grade and the shortest length and smallest number possible to minimize the potential for soil erosion and maintain forest productivity. Applicable AMPs need to be identified and decided upon before the logging operation begins. This includes AMPs to be implemented during the active phase of logging and those to be implemented immediately after logging. Effective application of the AMPs requires planning across the entire area to be logged and throughout the duration of the operation and immediately after logging. It's also important to locate, design, and construct truck roads, skid trails, and log landings so they can be used for future operations. Because roads are long-term landscape features, their location must be carefully chosen to meet the landowner's needs for safe access, avoid long-term maintenance problems, reduce the potential for degrading water quality, and minimize costs over the short and long term. Proper planning is going to avoid situations like this. Nobody wants to see this happen. <clears throat> Practices to control water flow include water buyers, broad-based dips, ditch turnouts, ditch relief culverts, silt fence, and hay belt check dams. These practices intercept and divert runoff from truck roads, skid trails, and log landings into forested areas where sediment is trapped and water is infiltrated. They also help to sustain the natural flow of water through a forest landscape. Stream crossings need to be properly sited and structures need to be adequately sized and properly installed to protect water quality and provide for water flow. Stream crossing structures are categorized as either temporary or permanent. Tempor uh, temporary crossings are generally in place for up to several months. Stream crossings on trails used by skidders, forwarders, and other logging equipment are generally considered to be temporary. The AMPs state that temporary structures are to be removed immediately after logging or as soon as ground conditions become favorable. Permanent structures are intended to be in place for many years. Truck road crossings, for example, can often be permanent features that require careful design, installation, and long-term periodic maintenance. Permanent stream crossing structures are occasionally installed on skid trails if the landowner has long-term access needs. It's important that permanent stream crossing structures be monitored and maintained to make sure they're functioning correctly and kept free of debris.
The AMPs call for seeding and mulching all areas, all areas of exposed mineral soil immediately adjacent to streams and other bodies of water. The AMPs also state that all areas of exposed soil at stream crossings must be seeded and mulched immediately upon installation, including the travel, excluding the travel portion of the truck road or skid trail. This AMP only pertains to the active phase of logging. A separate AMP requires all temporary stream crossing structures to remo be removed immediately after logging and approaches to the crossing are to be seeded and mulched 25 feet back from the stream. In some cases, brush and logging debris can also be an effective means for controlling soil erosion, such as in this example where logging slash is being used to stabilize a road ditch. The proper storage, handling, and use of hazardous materials are critical to protect water quality during timber harvesting operations. Timber harvesting equipment uses fuels, lubricants, coolants, and solvents, all of which are considered hazardous materials and are toxic at very low levels. Releases or spills of these materials to water, soil, or air are a hazard to the environment with certain reporting requirements. Although, although there's no specific AMP that addresses petroleum products and other hazardous materials associated with logging equipment in the orange, orange book, one has been included in the AMP revision, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation. Minimizing biological impacts to stream corridors is about maintaining stream buffers. These areas require special management considerations to protect water quality. The AMPs call for leaving forested buffers along streams where only light cutting could, should be conducted to maintain shade. No logging equipment is allowed within 25 feet of streams to minimize the potential for soil disturbance. Leaving forested buffers along streams and other bodies of water provides for sediment retention, stream bank stabilization, maintaining stream temperature, and also provides a food source for aquatic organisms. The AMPs were adopted on August 15, 1987 under the authority of 10 BSA Chapter 47, Vermont's Water Pollution Control Law. The AMPs are intended to prevent discharges of sediment, petroleum products, and woody debris, or logging slash, from entering streams and other bodies of water, to control, control soil erosion, and to maintain natural water temperature. As a result of the 1987 Clean Water Act Amendment, state forestry agencies across the country developed water quality BMPs to protect water resources on forestry operations. Vermont's AMPs are indistingu indistinguishable from what other states call BMPs. They're all based on sound principles of water pollution prevention and supported through research conducted on U.S. Forest Service experimental forests, such as the Hubbard Brook in New Hampshire, the Coweta in North Carolina, and the Ferno in West Virginia. The purpose of the AMP is to provide measures for loggers, foresters, and landowners to utilize before, during, and after logging operations to co comply with Vermont's water quality standards and state water quality statutes to minimize the potential for discharge. The AMPs apply to all logging operations, whether on public or private lands in Vermont, regardless of the purpose of the logging. For example, logging may be conducted for forest management purposes, or logging may be conducted for the purpose of clearing land for some other type of land use, such as commercial, residential, or electric utility development. If the AMPs are 
<clears throat> if the AMPs are, are not correctly implemented and the discharge occurs, there's a violation of the AMPs and therefore a water quality violation. In such situations, penalties may be accessed for the water quality violation as well as AMPs that are not implemented. If no discharge occurs, the logger or landowner cannot be fined or prosecuted for not implementing the AMPs. If the AMPs are correctly implemented, there's a presumption that the logging operation is complying with the state water quality statutes and the Vermont water quality standards, even if a discharge occurs as a result of logging. However, this presumption may be overcome if a water quality analysis demonstrates that there is a discharge of waste into waters of the state due to logging, and thus a violation of the state water quality statutes and the water quality standards. Therefore, although implement implementation of the, of the EMPs cannot guarantee that a discharge and a water quality violation will not occur, the EMPs constitute the best practice available to prevent discharges and logging operations. When correctly implemented, the AMPs provide a level of protection for the landowner and the logger against enforcement of water quality violations. Who is responsible for the AMPs? Under the Vermont Water Pollution Control Act, no person may discharge waste into the waters of the state without a permit. Therefore, landowners and loggers are responsible for correctly implementing the AMPs just prior to during and immediately after logging operations. However, a logger is ultimately responsible, for, I'm sorry, a landowner is ultimately responsible for any discharge that occurs on land he or she owns. Therefore, a logger should ensure that a landowner should ensure that a logger working on their land correctly implements the AMPs. So what happens when AMPs cannot be fully implemented? To protect water quality and prevent discharges of waste into state waters, the, AMP the AMPs must be correctly implemented. However, the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation recognizes that there may be limited situations where a particular AMP cannot be fully implemented as prescribed due to physical constraints on the ground. An example of this would be when the presence of rock or ledge prevents installation of a water bar on a skid trail or culvert on a truck road according to spacing requirements as prescribed in the AMPs. The department also recognizes that there may be existing infrastructures, truck roads, skid trails, and log landings in place for previous logging operations that are not in full compliance with the AMPs. An example could be a segment of a skid trail or truck road that exceeds allowable grade limits or is within a stream buffer. Such a non-compliant existing infrastructure should be corrected to be in compliance with the AMPs unless the action or actions create an unstable condition where the potential for soil erosion and water quality impairment is greater than if no action was taken. New construction should always follow the AMPs. Besides the obvious water quality benefits, there's also social values associated with adhering to the AMPs. Following the AMPs helps to maintain a positive public image, which is important for Vermont's timber industry to thrive and to sustain a healthy working force. Most loggers realize this and acknowledge that protecting water quality is not only required by law, but also a wise choice to make for their business. Since the adoption of the AMPs, the Department of Forests and Parks and Recreation has worked with the Department of Environmental Conservation's Environmental Enforcement Office in an effort to reduce the number and severity of discharges resulting from logging operations. The MOU that we have with them outlines a process to be followed that provides a consistent approach to reme remediation and enforcement of water quality violations associated with logging operations. This is a flow chart here that illustrates what that process is, looks like. Um, beginning, on the, beginning at the top, um, most of this 
most of the uh, most of this is due to complaints that we receive. It's basically a complaint driven type of uh, process. However, we do from time to time during our normal field operations run across um, uh, discharges and we'll, uh, from logging operations and we'll follow this investigative process. Um, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreations has five different administrative offices scattered across the, uh, uh, the state. Uh, within each one of these offices, we have an AMP forester, one staff person assigned uh, to work with loggers and landowners to uh, make sure that they're complying with the AMPs and not causing discharges to, to streams. So generally, a complaint will be will come into the office, and the, that AMP forester, whichever district he is in, will respond, try to gather as much information as he can, uh, get the landowner's name, the logger's name, and then conduct an initial site visit. Upon the initial visit, if no discharge is is uh, noted uh, on the right hand side of this screen, um, the case is closed. Uh, if the initial site visit does reveal a discharge, um, and if it's significant enough, the AMP forester may call upon assistance from uh, an environmental enforcement officer. Uh, if AMPs are prescribed, uh, AMPs will be prescribed upon site investigation. Um, the logger or landowner will have a certain timeline to get those recommendations put in place. We'll do a follow-up follow inspection, and if compliance is reached, then the case is closed. If we have no compliance or the logger refuses to work with us, then, then we just we turn it over to the enforcement folks and have them deal with it. During the initial site investigation, if we find that the, that the violations are so egregious and if it's been a repeat offender, we may just go directly to enforcement, but our first our first goal is always to make sure that we get uh, site mitigation completed. During our AMP site investigations, all sources of discharges are identified and documented as to where they originated within the area being logged. AMP foresters determine if, a, if the discharge originates from a truck road, log landing, skid trail, within a stream buffer or at a stream crossing. This pie chart graphically illustrates those sources of discharges from 2005 through 2000, 2014. It's not unusual to find multiple sources of discharges originating from a single logging operation. As you can see from this pie chart, stream crossings are, are an area of concern. We have 30% in this green area, lower left part of the pie chart is the stream crossings. These are an area of concern and actually deserve more attention. Um, the one category labeled skid trails uh, shows 26%. And that's mainly not so much skid trails that are located within the buffer, but the approaches of skid trails to stream crossings were uh, the logger failed to divert surface uh, runoff from that trail before it, entered, before it got to the stream crossing. So if you look at those two categories, skid trails and stream crossing, that comes up to 56% of all the discharges observed during this period of time. Data such as this is valuable for us to uh, target education, outreach, and deliver programs. I'll go through a few trends uh, during this time period. Uh, there's been a downward trend during this last during this time period from 2005 to 2014, where the number of AMP cases reported and investigated. During this time period, 403 AMP cases were reported and investigated, um, with a high of 57 cases investigated in 2006 and a low of 24 in 2014. During the same time period, there was also a downward trend in a number of cases where a discharge was evident with a high of 40 cases in 2010 and a low of 11 in 2000, 
2012 and 2014. Besides responding to complaints, we also provide technical assistance through the EMP monitoring program. And during, you can see from this uh, trend line here that during this time period from 2005 to 2014, we've actually seen an uptick in the number of requests that we've been receiving. Uh, these requests for technical assistance generally entail an AMP forester meeting with a logger at the logger's request. The meeting is generally held. Okay. Can everybody hear us now? Can someone type in? Oh, Maria's typing. Yes. Okay. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry about the technical difficulties there. Okay, so we shall resume. <clears throat> Revising the AMPs. <clears throat> um, Forest Parks and Recreation initiated the process of revising the AMPs a couple years ago and held a series of public stakeholder meetings around the state to solicit input. 
Act 64 of the Acts of 2015, the Vermont Clean Water Act, require the Commissioner of the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation to amend the AMPs by rule. So we're now in the process of doing that, and the timeline that LCAR has granted us requires us to have the rule adopted by November 16th, 2000 of this year. Uh, actually, right now at this time, uh, the LCAR hearing is going on where they're taking up the, the AMP rule. I missed out. Some of the key highlights um, I'll cover of the revision. Going through. Sorry, what is? Oh, it looks okay. like your slides are not reflected on what people are seeing. Oh. Oh boy. Should we just try? Apologies for the technical difficulties. There's a delay in the slides. Um, hmm. Does he still have the this is, box around? It's totally fine on his end, but it's not showing up on. about this. I'm just trying to refresh the presentation. I don't know why. It must be related to the network loss we just got on the audio. Okay. Thanks for your patience, everyone. It, it seems like we had a network issue. Is this where you left off, Gary? Yep. Okay, great. Yep. <clears throat> so you should be good to resume. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So, key highlights so the AMP revision um, include compliance with the ANR stream alteration rule and general permit. Landowners will need to comply with this rule and general permit for new and replacement of existing permanent stream crossing structures on perennial streams. The AMPs provide direction and guidance for sizing and installing temporary stream crossing structures only, those that are removed after logging. DEC provided new standards that were adopted <coughs> excuse me, in the proposed AMP revisions for sizing temporary stream crossing structures. The size of a temporary stream crossing structure is dependent upon the area of the watershed that is draining and is determined by expected flows of the two-year flood event and based upon the premise that a logging operation will not extend beyond one year. As I mentioned earlier, there was no AMP in the Orange Book that addressed the management of petroleum products and other hazardous materials on logging operations. The new AMP states that petroleum products and other hazardous materials shall be stored only outside of forest buffers and shall be removed immediately upon completion of logging. Table 1, which um, <clears throat> is a table that provides spacing requirements for water control diversions, was reformatted to provide for better clarification uh, of water diversions required on truck roads and skitch rails during logging versus after logging. Um, more water diversions are required in the EMPs and in this table one after logging than during logging because after logging is completed, you know, the job, uh, the trails are closed out and probably will not be used for another 15 to 20 years. 
The spacing requirements were not changed. They're based upon the amount of slope. The greater the slope, the greater number of water bars required to control soil erosion. These spacing requirements are based upon many years of research conducted by the U.S. Forest Service research stations and have been adopted uh, by other states in their BMP manuals. With the exception of stream crossings where necessary, the revised AMPs make it explicitly clear that no new truck roads, skid trails, or log landings are allowed in the buffer. Existing truck roads, skid trails, and log landings within the buffer may only be used if there's no other feasible alternative for relocation or if it would result in greater potential for erosion and discharge. <clears throat> We've also strengthened the standards to minimize the potential of sedimentation at stream crossings. The AMPs in the Orange Book stated that road ditches shall not terminate directly into streams, but it did not give clear direction on how to manage that ditch water so that it didn't pose a potential source for a discharge to occur. The revision states that ditches must be turned out into the buffer a minimum of 25 feet from the stream as, as measured from the top of the bank. We've also enhanced seeding and mulching requirements. Uh, seeding and mulching requirements have increased from 25 feet to 50 feet on each side of temporary stream crossings. That's after a logging operation is closed out. Um, we feel that this is a low cost but very effective method to better ensure protection of water quality. So I'll talk a little bit now about the AMPs and how they relate to the Lake Champlain TM deal. The forest land contributes a relatively small amount of phosphorus per unit area, which is the loading rate. But because forest land covers such a huge amount of the basin, it represents a fairly large source of phosphorus in some watersheds. This should be familiar with you, to you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Um, given that there's less detailed information on the, and I, I basically took this from the TM deal, uh, given the fact that there's less detailed information on the forest load sources and the magnitudes available from the SWAP modeling work, EPA chose to rely upon only a modest reduction, 5% from the forest sector for the lake segment watersheds where less overall reduction is needed. However, in Missisquoi Bay and the South Lake B, uh, the forest reduction goals were set at 50% and 40% respectively. This is due to the large reductions needed where these segments as determined by SWAP modeling. So as reasonable assurance that we'll do our job, uh, the EPA is saying that they've accepted revisions, proposed revisions to the EMPs uh, to reach that, that will that will provide them the reasonable assurance that phosphorus reductions will be achieved from forestry. Additional actions for the Missisco in the South Lake B include accelerating the implementation of NRCS, that's the Natural Resource Conservation Service, cost share practices that are going to be directed at forest water quality and are funded through the RCPP. The, Resort Regional, Regional Conservation Partnership Program yeah. program to improve water quality and reduce phosphorus within the Lake Champlain Basin. So these practice the specific practices that we're doing and will be doing include erosion control on forest trails and landings, improving permanent stream crossings, um, and planting replanting forest riparian areas and stabilizing critical areas. We have two department foresters that are focusing their efforts on these challenge watersheds by providing technical assistance to landowners participating in RCPP. We also have the healthy forest cover strategy in our, in our plan. Um, that strategy, which is already underway, includes a detailed sequence of action steps to achieve no net forest loss and improve the health and extent of forests throughout the state. The strategy includes incentive-based measures to restore forest buffers to riparian areas current lack, currently lacking adequate buffers. 
These efforts combined with the major enhancements to the EMPs, including in particular practices that address erosion and sedimentation at water crossings, forest roads, log landings, and throughout the forest harvest sites, provides assurance that additional phosphorus reductions assume <clears throat> from forest lands in the EPA's analysis for these watersheds will be achieved. One of the deliverables under the Lake Champlain RCPP grant is to increase the capacity of portable skitter bridges in the Lake Champlain Basin for loggers to use. Portable skitter bridges are considered a BMP for protecting water quality during logging because they cause less stream channel disturbance compared to other alternatives such as culverts or fords. From an ERP grant that the Vermont Association of Conservation Districts received in 2015, Capacity has been increased within the Lake Champlain Basin. During these last two years, 13 new bridges were built for loggers to rent from natural resources conservation districts. Most of those bridges are located within the basin and available for loggers to pick up at sawmills and log yards where they're stored. As an additional outcome of this grant project, there's, there are two new host sites within the basin where bridges are now being stored. They include a new site in Milton as well as one in Castleton. Altogether, there's eight whole sites scattered throughout the basins where, where loggers can rent bridges. In addition to the option of loggers renting bridges, I should add that many of them, more and more loggers are actually building in uh, their own bridges now and own their own bridges that they use in their operations on a regular basis. So this is my last slide, I believe. I just wanted to give you a little preview. Uh, I mentioned that you know the, we're getting close to finalizing the AMP rule. Um, there will be a new guidance document that supports the rule that we have in draft form now, and we'll be hopefully working on over the winter. <clears throat> so within that, within that new, uh, the new revised manual. Uh, we'll make sure that each AMP will be accompanied by a narrative section called Supportive Information and Technical Guidance. Uh, this will provide instruction of how to implement the AMP so that they're functioning correctly. Graphics and pictures are going to be included for visual illustration as well. We're going to be adding a section on planning for water quality. The Orange Brook now currently doesn't have any, anything regarding planning. There'll be, there'll be a section on just general planning for water quality for logging as well as specific AMP planning considerations for truck roads, skid trails, stream crossings, stream buffers, and log landings. The manual will also address protective measures to use and special conditions that apply when logging in Vermont wetlands, <clears throat> as well as for managing hazardous materials during logging operations. And that's the end of the presentation. Any questions in the room? Or um, if you're online, you want to go ahead and type in any questions you might have. Or if you prefer to ask them, I believe you can unmute yourself through Skype. Um, but we have about 10 minutes. And it looks like somebody, oh, you got it. Yep. Um, question online, when discussing buffers and landing trails, roads, et cetera, what or who defines a feasible alternative? Oops, sorry. You just click on that, it'll show up. Feasible alternative, and what if there is a disagreement about that determination? Um, there again, I think I, I mentioned part of our AMP monitoring program is to provide technical assistance to loggers and landowners. So um, we'd rather be proactive than reactive. Uh, we'd rather spend our time up front working with landowners and loggers. So <clears throat> um, I imagine that the AMP forester would be contacted and set up a date to go out and take a look at the situation. And try to figure out, you know, first of all, if there is a feasible alternative or not. 
Um, a lot of it will be based upon the, the discretion of, of the EMP forester. Um, if the if the if the trail or landing um, cannot be feasibly located, then we'll try to. I'm sure the EMP forester will provide some additional recommendations to ensure that water quality is protected. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any um, online either. So, Gary, thank you very much for presenting this morning. Um, and remember, we have another brown bag uh, next month um, for the second be the second Thursday of the month. So thanks a lot for everyone who attended. Thank you.